Thank you. You can be seated. Um, we're going to page 59 in the book. Where it talks about creative ideas. <laughs> and what ministry looks like for the average person. While I was running from God, ministry for myself looked like sweeping the floors, mopping, cleaning the walls, cleaning the toilets, doing uh, the sound system, teaching Sunday school. Everything's important that needs done in a church. And everything is ministry. So anything you put your hand to do, you need to do it as unto the Lord. Holding the microphone is a very small part of ministry. So I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 26. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many, just, and, and before you interpret. And just as we look around the room, we all need to look at each other. There are, there are many of us, but we all make up one body. So now you can read verse 14. Okay, verse 14. Yeah. If the foot, sh okay, you done? Yeah. If okay. the foot shall say, "Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body," is it therefore not of the body? So let's stop here a second. If my hand tries to tell me it's not going to do what I want it to do because it's not the head. I don't belong to you anymore. We cannot tell the pastor when he asks us to do something. No. That's rebellion. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I had some young people come to me one day. And they were talking to me. And one young man said to me, Pastor asked me to lead song service tonight, and I said no. I physically got up and moved to another seat, away from where I was sitting beside him. And he looked at me and said, why'd you do that? And I said, because God could strike you dead. <laughs> you had the audacity to tell the man of God in your life, no. We don't have that privilege. If my pastor would call me and say, I'll pay to change your plane ticket, I need you in Houston as soon as you can get here. My answer would be, yes, sir. When am I leaving, sir? Two 
To obey is better than sacrifice. And as leaders, pastors, ministry, every pastor should have a pastor. Every pastor should have a leader they are submitted to. Every minister should have somebody who can tap you on the shoulder and say, you went too far tonight. You need to sit down a while. And you sit down. Might not do it with a smile in the beginning. But before you stand back up, you will be smiling. I'm being honest. I tell people all over the world, if you have a pastor or a minister in your life that doesn't have someone he answers to, run. Do not go to his church. Do not listen to him. Great leaders are submitted to someone. Dictators are not submitted to anyone. And we have no place in the church of the living God for dictators. Jesus gave us choices. And he set up organization and strategy. Throughout the entire Bible. Okay, let's go on. Verse 16. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased them. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these, we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Who's the youngest person in the room? I want the youngest person to stand. And I want the oldest person to raise your hand. Okay. He looks good. <laughs> okay. You're older. You don't look quite so good. I mean, you still look good, but you don't look as good as he does, okay? Because he's got youth. 
But you've got maturity. So he gets as much honor as you get. Because we're one in the body. We need you as much as we need him. His wisdom and maturity will mature you. But your youth and your crazy ideas will make us younger. And we will have to consider the things you bring to us. So you should never quit thinking your crazy ideas. But you have to realize he has wisdom and maturity to know what will work and what won't work. And some of your ideas he may not be sure about. But you have to let him try. That's the beauty of the body working together. You can be seated. I just wanted to give you an example you would remember. It's very important. We, we look at the importance of the youth. And we teach the youth to recognize the wisdom of the elders. And realize that if we do let you do a crazy idea and it flops or fails, that when the roles are reversed and you're him, and a young man is sitting there, you'll know the importance of letting that young man try something. So it, it self, and I don't know a, new, a word for this, self-perpetuates. In other words, it keeps redoing itself over and over again. But we have to be willing to let them try. And those that are feeble, the younger ones need to understand the importance of them in the church. We need people of all ages. We need children, babies. We need people in their midlife. People who are just starting to become grandparents. And people who may be great, great, great grandparents. All of them bring beauty to the body. With, without them, we cannot be what God wants us to be. And we've also got to understand no matter where we are in ministry, we cannot put ourselves above someone else. We're servants. It means we're here at the pleasure of the people. Just as Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. Perhaps if you've been in an exalted position for a while, you might need to call a service where you wash everyone's feet to show them you're there to serve them. And that's following the example of Jesus. So no matter what we do, whether we clean, travel the world, cook, preach, teach, write, None of us are more important than any other one of us. Yes, we need to give honor where honor is due. But I've sat through too many services. Where I've been sitting there and saying, can't we have church already? And 
I'm afraid when we put people up on pedestals, we're putting Jesus down. So we've got to be careful. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. <coughs> so diversities in ministries, page 60. Just as every single one of us look different. And our fingerprints are uniquely different. Just as the, believe it or not, every giraffe. giraffe has a unique design on it. Every giraffe's circles or whatever are different than another one. Why then do we want to make everybody fit in this mold? When God may be calling you to do something uniquely different. Let's read 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fable unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Sorry. Five. Five. All right. Be instant in season and out. Every now and again, I'll have a Sunday free in, in the United States. And I'll drive into a parking lot of a church. Needing something from God for me. Where I need to be ministered to. Where I just want to slip in the back of the church and sit down. So I've learned to go late. So I won't get asked to preach. But when I forget and I pull in and church is about to start and the pastor's still outside. They walk over to the car and they say, Sister Smith. I'm so glad you're here. I know you have a word from God for us today. And I'm thinking I ain't even got a word from God for myself, let alone you. <laughs> and then they look at me and they say, by the way, you're preaching. Yeah. I have five minutes warning. <laughs> if that. But I stand up and I preach. When you study every day, you're always prepared. You may not know what you're going to say. And sometimes I don't have a clue till the microphone's in my hand. Not because of lack of study. But just because I depend on him. And I've made this statement many times. 
What God wants me to do today is on a need-to-know basis. And evidently, I don't need to know yet. <laughs> okay. It's okay to have doubts. And sometimes we need to admit those doubts to the people we are ministering to. So that they become okay with their doubts. And then they look at me and you. And they say, well, if they have doubts, and they stepped out, I can have doubts. And I can step out. You understand where I'm going? Second Timothy three sixteen through seventeen are two verses we know. Second Timothy three sixteen to seventeen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Again, why? Verse seventeen tells us why. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The, wor the Bible tells us that the word wor washes us and cleanses us. But if we don't spend time in it, how can it cleanse us? We have to let his word cleanse us. So ministry looks different for every single one of us. The more we give our talents to God, the more he multiplies them. The little 11-year-old girl that wrote a play for her church almost 48 years ago, 48 would never believe that she would be, had, have written 27 books and be traveling around the world. It starts little and it multiplies. The photography, every talent I have, I've given to him. And God knows it's his. And that's, that's what you need to do with your talents. And let God multiply them. If you have an engineering brain, God can use that. If you have a scientific mind, God can use that. If you're stupid like me, God can use that. He can use whatever you've got. But you've got to be willing to let him have it. And yes, you'll use it for a career. But you should also use it for um, the Lord. And when we use things for God, you'll be surprised how it flows over into your your career and how God will open doors for you to minister in a boardroom. We must be open to minister wherever God places us. Now, and I kind of did this a little bit at the very beginning, recognize and respect for each other's anointing. I'm not going to read in 1 Samuel 24 that story because we know it well. Where David went and cut off the uh, robe of Saul. 
Pakaenda David akanodimbura nguo ya Saul. And then he was the Lord talked to him I believe. Apo ndinotenda kuti mwari wakazotaura naye. And he was convicted. Akanzwa why? Because he knew the scripture. And we must always remember the scripture. First Chronicles 16:21 and 22 at the top of page 62. He suffered no man to do them wrong, yea, he reproved kings for their sakes. Saying, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. And then it's repeated almost word for word in Psalms 105, 14 and 15. So we have to respect each other. If we see someone doing something wrong, we should take it to the leader above us. Not gossip among our sisters and our brothers. Let's not destroy ministries. When we do, we're going directly against the Lord. Page 63 talks about anticipating takeoff of ministry. You see, when we learn how to obey, we are closer to take off in our ministries. That's okay. We'll stop for a minute. Okay. Okay. So, we're on page 63, anticipating takeoff of ministry. And let me tell you how God gave me this thought. Uh, I was sitting on an airplane in Washington, D.C. Taking off to fly to Florida to go to Africa. I was exhausted. I had been bouncing all over the world like a yo-yo. And as I sat there, I had my headphones on. My headphones, not the airline headphones. And I thought it was the pilot speaking. And God spoke to me. And said, you're getting ready to take off. You will have no delays. And I looked around and I thought, wait a minute, these aren't the headphones the airline gives. These were hooked to my phone. Playing my Christian music in my ears. It suddenly hit me that God was talking to me. And I'm telling somebody here. You've been anticipating or getting ready for your ministry to take off. And I'm here to ask you, what are you waiting on? It's time to move. Okay? Haggai 2, 1 through 9, and then verses 18 through 23, I'm not going to read. Haggai 2, 1 to 9, and this was reading. In it, in this passage, it tells us the word of God came by the prophet. He was told to go to the governor and the high priest. And he was to ask them who had seen the glory of the first house or the glory of the first temple that was left. 
Unako wakanga ruripo, pani mba yukutanga, ni iso, wakanga sasi wa mba yukutanga. And I'm here today to ask you. Ndugu da uti ndiku funzei. I know in Africa we've seen many miracles, okay? There are lots of services where we see amazing things happen here. But why aren't we seeing more? Like when the missionaries first came. What's stopping it? We've gotten used to the manna. Just like the children of Israel. We can't expect the people we are leading to be hungry for more of God. If we as leaders are not hungry for more of God. Matthew 22, 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. I have a question for the leaders. While many are called, but few are chosen. Do we recognize the ones that are chosen that have rejected the offer from God? And do we know how to help them so that they quit rejecting the job offer from God? The greatest job offer anyone will ever get is to serve God as a minister. Okay. Sometimes God asks us to give up our dreams and visions. And we have to lay them on the altar. I believe it was last night I told you about the miracle of me going back to school and how fast God did that. I'm one of those crazy people that love to study. And when God called me to this, I had to lay down my dream of going back to school someday. In order to focus all of my time and energy on what God wanted. But what most would have seen as a horrible sacrifice was actually the sacrifice God consumed by fire. And opened many doors for me. And then God said, you know what? You've been faithful. I'm going to let you have your dream. Because God knows now that I love him more. We have to love God more. You see, I believe we've reached the day where if we reject the anointing of God, we reject, we reject God. In this rejection of God, we will no longer be able to operate in the Holy Ghost until we accept the anointing. And, and the calling placed upon our lives. And while I believe we serve a God of mercy and grace, that doesn't give us the ability to continually reject God in rebellion. It's time we quit arguing with God. And we step out in faith. When we step out in faith, that's when we're, we quit being the plane sitting on the runway idling. 
Tinenge tafana na nendege ya mira munzira ili kutendelela oti gazele oti kozo. And we've pulled the throttle back. Tinozo sumu, tinozo siya shese shaka shata And we're sailing down the runway taking off. Tinozo tanga kumanya nepano manywana apo tichienda kutiti kozo sumuka. I don't just want to just take off. I want to soar with Jesus in the clouds. And I'm not talking about the rapture here. I'm talking about soaring with him in the anointing. In his will for my life. Hosea 10, 12. I'm not quite to the bottom of page 66. Hosea 10, 12. Says, so to yourselves right in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ejgara mkururama ugokoa murudo undai makombo enyu for it is time for to see uh, it's okay okay and while you're interpreting good I just feel like we need to change it up no, it's okay. I'd like you to switch places with him and let him interpret for me. Okay. There by the fridge. All right. All okay? Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we need to switch it up. Yeah. The young man. Yeah. No, no, the young man. I want um, the young one. I want him to try. Yeah. Okay? I mean, it's okay. I want him to try. <laughs> yeah. Okay? They'll never learn if we don't let them try. Yeah. Sure. Okay? <laughs> and in this environment is the place. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Are you good? I'll try to stick to the book, Okay. <laughs> All right. I want you to do your best, okay? So, when things go wrong, can you interpret that? You can't. Okay. Can you interpret when things go wrong? Okay. I want to I want to see the kids do it. Okay? When things go wrong. Okay. You need to speak up, okay? All right. Most of the time, we need to be reminded why we're here. Yes. And while a lot will question why I want a young person, mm -hmm. a lot will question why I want you here. Mm -hmm. Interpret that. Mm -hmm. Or you help him. You help him. That's how he'll learn. Okay? We need them to get comfortable. Exactly. Okay. So, as we get them comfortable, we are sowing in righteousness because they'll never get it if they never feel the anointing. That flows from me to him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're not comfortable, we'll let him come back and you can go sit down. Okay. But if you're comfortable, I'll keep you. It's up to you. Your choice. Okay. All right. He can continue. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Let's, let's have him come. Okay. Because we want it to be comfortable. That's what teaching is about. That's what teaching is about. Okay. And when you teach, you need to do that. Yes. You need to use the one who's the least skilled. Mm -hmm. Did you understand that? Tell them they need to use the one who's the least skilled. Mm -hmm. So that they will find out that maybe this really isn't too hard if they apply themselves. And someday he or you will be the next great evangelist for Zimbabwe. I'm not joking. I'm serious. 
But they'll never know if we never give them the opportunity. Okay? Yes. That was kind of off notes, but kind of on notes. <laughs> okay? Let's go to page 67. James 4, 7. James 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. The most misquoted verse in the Bible. We forget, submit yourselves therefore to God. Oh, if you resist the devil, he'll flee. Uh-uh. No. You got to be submitted to God first. If you're not submitted to God, the devil's going to laugh in your face. And then as these young ones grow and they take on more positions, the, the older ones of us know that new levels in God equal new devils. They come at you a different way. They come at you through your family. Sometimes they come at you through your pastor. They come at you through well-meaning, super spiritual idiots, for lack of better words. <laughs> okay? So we've got to make sure they understand that as God uses them, they'll still be in a battle. But the battle will be more intense. So in our taking off after being cleared for takeoff, when we start to go through the clouds, the plane starts to do this. Because the clouds create friction. And sometimes you're sailing along fine above the clouds. And all of a sudden there's an air pocket. And the plane can drop a thousand feet like that. Trust me, it's quite the experience. <laughs> I was on a plane coming out of Turkey one year. And I was seated by a couple of beautiful Muslim people. We were in the very back of the plane. And the pilot came over and said that we were going to have some turbulence. I had a neck pillow on. They were nervous. And I said to them, it's not an issue. We'll land in New York City if God himself has to put his hand under this plane to get us there. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, God's already given me my schedule for the next year. And he makes no mistakes. I'm going to sleep. I went to sleep and I woke up when we were landing in New York. Some people had been thrown up based on the smell. So it must have been a lot of turbulence. And sometimes there's a lot of battles we have to go through. But as they told me, when my husband died, God never puts more on you than you can bear. And then they also said, We've been watching God grind you into a fine powder. We can't wait to see what kind of anointing comes out of this. And then they said the one I love to hear. God must really trust you. And I started laughing. Yes. And I said I could do with a lot less trust. 
Because I was tired of the battle. It's okay to get tired of the battle. Just don't quit battling. Don't quit fighting for God. Okay, Acts 17, 27 through 28. We're going to talk about aborting takeoff of ministry on page 68. Yeah, right here. Acts 17, 27 says that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him and be not far from every one of us. Try. Yeah. It's, you find it? It's right here. Okay. Chakamaru wako ni mfaru ukamuana unengwa kure ni wamu wanuwezi. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets said, for we are also his offspring. Maari tinura rama tinufamba Uyeze, pa unyanduri wacho, tinopa, taku suharu wa isuwa na wa maswa. And we Sem- are. I'm sorry, go ahead. Tinopa, taku suharu wa isuwa na wa maswa, nuseruzu wawo. And we are his children. Uyeze, tiriba na wawo. I went to Poland a few years ago. Wakenda kunyika e Poland, makora pera mseri. And I'm sure you've all heard of Auschwitz, the camp, where they terrorized the Jews. Mese makanza, Auschwitz, kembi mai well, I went to the books to see the names of the prisoners. And I know my family was from Germany. So I flipped to my maiden name. And I saw names similar. So I took pictures of it. And I sent it to my cousin because for his doctoral dissertation he had written a book on the family but he could never find proof that our family was tortured by sheer accident I found the proof he had sought for over a hundred years and I sent it to my cousin to find out that we are Jewish. Granted, it's very watered down. I'm probably one one hundredth Jewish. But we all come from Adam and Eve. We look different because of the places that we've lived. We all have the same blood flowing through our veins. No matter what color our skin is. So in aborting takeoff of ministry. You cannot think just because somebody's from America. They have more potential than you do. We are all born the same way. If you apply yourself, whether you're in Zimbabwe, Europe, anywhere else in Africa, or the U.S., you have the ability within you to be anything you can dream. Any dream God gives you can and will come to pass. I was counseling a young lady once and she's made some wrong choices. But someday the dream she told me about will come to pass. We were eating after church. And she asked me the question. How do you know God's will? So I'm going to ask you that question. How do you know God's will? 
I'm going to tell you what I told her in a minute, but I want to hear your thoughts. How do you know God's will? We'll start with you. To know God's will is that I must follow what the Lord wants and be obedient to His will. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to phrase the question different. How do you know God's will for you? Anybody? What's your thoughts? Yeah. If you see something uh, happening that, that is against God, that thing will not prosper. Okay. Okay. Have any of you young ones had a dream? Yes. 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 And I said, okay, what was it? She said, I was standing on a stage. And I was in a foreign country. And I was surrounded by black people. And I was preaching. And I said, well, there you have it. That's the will of God for your life. Didn't take much to interpret that dream. So think about your craziest dream if you're young. Well, even if you're old. You're not too old or too young for it to come to pass. You just have to be willing to take God at, what, at the dream he gave you. Now, if it's got you shooting a place up, no. Okay? <laughs> it's, if it's got you killing people, then it's not. Okay? Dreams and visions we have never go against the word of God. Never. Mm. Okay? Yes. But they are crazy. I'll be the first one to tell you they're crazy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I step out and I say, Really, God? You want me to do what? And Lord, how big a check are you going to write to pay for this? Or where's the money going to come from to pay for this? Important things to note. When God gives you a dream or a vision, it might take years for it to come to pass. And it might happen tomorrow. Secondly, never or thirdly, never worry about where the money's coming from. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. When I got these loans to further my education, I can't afford the payments when they come due. But if it's his will, it's his bill. And that's what you have to remember. Don't be stupid. Okay? So when we abort takeoff, we have to understand our walk with God is just that. It's a walk with God. Let's read Colossians 4, 13 through 14 towards the bottom of page 68. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Heropolis. Verse 14 is what I really want you to see, to see. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. 
ane basa guru re ufizishen dino ku Morosai and Dimas ndo ku Morosai panguwa yo inwe based on this passage Dimas who we beat up was part of the inner circle. What happened to him? Why did he lose out with God? Did he have doubts? Did he start missing church and no one missed him? If he was part of the inner circle, Luke should have grabbed him close. But we don't see any of that in scripture. All we see is this mention here. And then in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, Second Timothy 4, verse 10, top of 69, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and we can stop there. That's really all we need of that passage. For Demas hath forsaken. Demas and Regerera. Agura Rama Armunica Ino. Amva Asia of Thessalonica. Crescent ne Galatia. Titus ne Dalmatia. You see, this is why we need the wisdom of the elders. Descanti Chida Rusio Gue Vacurvedu. And the energy of the young people. Because we've got to be careful as ministry that we don't fall in love with the popularity and the honor that people give us. You see, if the devil can't get to us any other way, He'll try to get us through our pride. That's why when I'm in churches and they stand up to introduce me, and they start talking about everything I've done, and all this, how great a person you are. I just want to dig a hole and crawl under the building. Because I know when I get back to my motel room that night or wherever I'm staying, I call it eating carpet. Or here you may say eating dirt. I have to get myself down as low as I can get and humble myself before God. Because all those words make our flesh feel good. We like to be patted on the back and told how nice we are. We have to be careful. Pride has killed more than one minister. Okay, and fear. We talked about fear last night, so I think I'm going to skip this next section. We've got to have faith, trusting in God to do the impossible, and He will. Let's read Luke 18, 18 through 27 on page 70. Luke 18, verse 18 to 27. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I'm going to skip 19 and 20 and go to 21. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Verse 22. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Verse 23, And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Let me ask you this. Could he have been the next Apostle Paul? But because of his wealth, he couldn't walk away. 
Every time I walk away from that nice house and lock the door and get in the car and drive thousands of miles or fly thousands of miles. I know people think she must be crazy. Who would leave comfort? But you see, we have to be uncomfortable in God. When we're uncomfortable in God is when we are growing the most. Our possessions cannot mean more to us than God. You see, opportunities are presented to us spiritually. Top of page 71. Usually when we're presented an opportunity, we have to walk away from something we love. Now, I'm not talking about walking away from families. I'm talking about walking away from a career. Or walking away from a church we're pastoring. To go somewhere crazy. And start something new. Or to evangelize. But we have to give up something in order for the fire of God to consume us. We have to be willing to sacrifice and put the sacrifice on the altar. Let's talk about Lot a few minutes. Page 71. Lot. Lot. Or 72. Lot. Lot. We're not going to read the scripture. We know the story. Sure. You see, Abram had a lot of trouble because he took Lot with him. God always gives us specific instructions. Abram was 70 years old when he left his home. And he was told by God take none of your family with you. But he took his nephew Lot and Lot would cause him a lot of trouble. When we don't obey God completely we have problems. So Let's talk about who Lot was first. Terah was his grandfather. Haram was his father. Abram and Nahor were his uncles. He was the third generation. From Terra. And if we pay attention to church history, we'll find it's in the third generation where we start to lose the youth. New converts will stay on fire. Their children will stay on fire. It's that next generation that we will lose if we don't start having something available for them. Because you see, the first generation got the revelation straight from God. And the second generation watched it. But the third generation didn't. They don't have it. You see, I could quote scriptures all day long about the oneness of God and holiness and what I believe. But I didn't have a revelation until my first trip to Kenya. My children were already grown and backslidden at that point. 
Why? Because mama wasn't on fire. Mama was third generation. Mama didn't make it important. As leaders, we've got to show them by example how to live. And just because these young people could probably quote Acts 2.38 and Deuteronomy 6 and 4. And Deuteronomy 6 and 4. That doesn't mean they have a revelation of the oneness of God. That first trip to Africa. I had to get up and teach to Trinitarians. The oneness of God. I stayed up all night. And I asked God for a revelation. I couldn't explain it to them if I didn't have a revelation. I started in Genesis. And by four o'clock in the morning, I went to Revelation. And I had a little flip phone with a pen light. And I hand wrote all those scriptures I found. And at four o'clock in the morning, in that little mud hut, angels filled that room. You couldn't tell me there's three gods. Because God gave me a revelation. It revolutionized my life. We've got to make sure the children get it. And they'll only get it if we're sold out. And the saints in the church will only get it if we show them how sold out we are by how we live. You see, Lot was the third generation. He didn't get it. He traveled with Abram, who talked with God, and he still didn't get it. We each have to get it for ourselves. We can't hang on to daddy's coat. We have to have our own. You understand? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know I'm talking to leaders, but sometimes we're the worst. Because we just start doing it. And we get all wrapped up in the work of the gospel. That we forget that we need to have people who have a revelation of who God is. When people have a revelation, it's different. It's catching. People love the anointing I preach with. We've even discussed that as early as this morning. What's different about me? I'm sold out. I have a revelation. I have a passion like a new convert. Even though I was, too, even though I was taken to church when I was three days old. And I got the Holy Ghost and was baptized at the age of seven. I really wasn't born again until after my first trip to Africa. I, that night, I count as one of the top things that's ever happened in my life. And if you're hungry enough, God can do something like that for you. But it's between you and him. Okay? Page 74. In a boarding takeoff, we have to be careful. 
2 Chronicles 12, 1 and 2, uh, page 74. It says, And it came to pass, when Rehoboam established the kingdom and strengthened himself, he forsook the law of God and all Israel with him. And it came to pass, in that fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Second, there, you see it? Right here. Yeah. Egypt. What can we take from that scripture? Did you finish? I'm sorry. Okay. So what can we take from that scripture? Well, we can take that Rehoboam got off on the right start. But after he established, we could say, let's take it to establish a church. After he established a church. He strengthened himself. It doesn't say he strengthened himself in God. It says he strengthened himself. So we've got to be careful as leaders. We don't start to believe it's us that's doing this. We've got to believe that it's God doing it. Page 75. We cannot abort takeoff to make sure that we don't abort our takeoff and never get out of the landing zone or the runway, sorry, no, runway. You know, because you can get to the end of the runway and you can still abort takeoff. When you're in a plane, we can do the same thing with ministry. So we've got to make sure we don't do that. It comes in, in many little things that we don't really pay attention to sometimes. It can be the fact that you take a promotion at your job innocently. But then you start to have to work more hours. And you did it so that you could provide for your family better. You did it with the right intentions. But all of a sudden, you can't make church. Or you don't have time for a private walk with God. That's when you have to say, okay. I need to do something different. God, you need to help me. And you need to make a different choice. Maybe you have to look for a different job. And make less money. But it's more important you have a walk with God. And believe me, I know how hard it is here for you to live. I grew up in the country. My father made very little money. My mother made my clothes growing up. I had never walked in a mall until I was a senior in high school. And I got a new outfit for the first day of school. That was store-bought. I know how hard it is. Mm. I get it. That's why we have to be so careful. Just because you think progress and more plants is the future of Zimbabwe. But all that does is give people less time to serve God. Yes, we need more money. 
Now your family should not go hungry. I'm the first one to say that. But we got to be careful. We don't want to let things get in the way of our relationship with God. Or promotions. You see, it's never been about us. It's always been about Jesus. You see, we've got to give dev the devils an eviction notice. And I was actually in Zimbabwe when I wrote most of this. <coughs> and I was taken to walk laps around a building. And pray. Most wouldn't have went. But the missionary asked. I see. And I was here under him. So my answer was, yes, sir, when do we leave? I threw my backpack on and I, I prayed. I walked and I prayed. Sometimes that's all God wants us to do is walk and pray. And God will do the work. And sometimes... In our walking and praying, we're giving the devil an eviction notice on our town. Okay. Now let's talk about taking off. Bottom of page 79. I've got to move quickly. I've cut 21 more pages to go. I'm moving real slow. <laughs> so taking off. We were in Binga. That's where I wrote this part, in Binga. At the Extension Bible School. I, I learned a lot from your people there. I was almost in tears a lot of the time. Because your people came from everywhere to be taught. Mm. And they slept on the floor. Mm. While I slept in a bed. Mm. It humbled me. Just like the 35 who showed up in the back of the lorry last weekend in Kadoma. That just tore my heart out. The fact that you all would ride in the back of a lorry on a very cold day and sleep God knows where just to be in church. Mm. I am a very spoiled American. You just don't realize how much you humble me. I'm sorry. It just really tears my heart out. Your love for God makes mine look like nothing. It really does. I honor you. I really do. You've taught me so, so much. And I know this isn't in the notes. But you need to know. You've changed me. I'll never be the same. I admire you, every single one of you. Okay? Sorry, got to get back to the notes. It just gets to me. And when I read that, I, I just I had to give you the example so you'll understand. Mm. In August, I'll go back to an air-conditioned car people who love me and who will treat me like homespun gold while you're still here struggling and I've got to do whatever I can to help you okay alright anyway okay so Taking off. Taking off. First Timothy 1, 18 through 20. One Timothy 1, verse 18, which is 20. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Yes, you know, Timothy, 
kuzimisiki zo zvechiporofita zvakawana pamberi pangu zvitiri pakati pe pe hondo yakawa hondo yakarwiwa zvakanaka holding faith in a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck kuti tivudu pakumirira kwedu ne kumufungo wedu wakanaka tiveta tsaba taisa kure zvinhu zvino viringidza zvino viringidza china mato chedu you see we're going to stop there okay to win the war kutichamira pano kuti tihuti tikwanze kuti tikunde hondo against the devil and not just win minor battles tikunde hondo kuna satan wedu isingori hondo diga si hondo dzombe we have to stand up and take responsible responsibility for what we've been given tinofana kumira nebasa ratinge tapiwa those of us isu wedu of the name of Jesus that know that this book is love letters written to us from God. If you had a love letter from your lover, would you not wear it out reading it? Shouldn't we wear out our Bibles? Reading them and trying to understand them. Yes. That's when we won't make the word of God shipwreck. Okay. So to win the war, we got to know the book. We've got to be a soldier that wins the war and battles mightily for Jesus. So how do we battle? It's not with guns. It's not with fist. It's on our knees with our hands raised. That's where we win our best battles. So when we've taken off, what should we expect from God once we get to cruising altitude? And that's the easiest place to lose out with God. That's when you've arrived. You're somebody. And you start to believe the nonsense they say about you. That's why when he gives me compliments I say, "Oh no." That's not me. I'm just a servant. I don't want pride to get a hold of me. And I know it's a way of honor. And I have to say thank you. But I have to rein me in. Okay? So we've got to be careful when we hit cruising altitude. That's when our families and our children get comfortable with what we have. With the blessings of God. And then our children slip and fall into sin. And instead of them paying a price for what they've done let's say this is their sin we cover it up and we say no we're gonna we're gonna fix this you keep singing you keep preaching when if it was anybody else we'd have said hey you come here you need to sit down for six months our children should not be excused from punishment we should not cover up their sin the people who we are leading Watch our interactions with our families. And they know. And if we don't make them pay the same price. They'll lose out with God. And we'll have to answer to God for their souls. So we've got to make sure. It's the same. No matter if it's the person who doesn't pay Ty's child. Or if it's the pastor's child. We need to level it. We've lost so many. Who got so hurt. And it was our fault. 
We have to take responsibility. So once we're at cruising altitude, we've got to understand. I'm just going to read Zechariah 2 and 5 on page 81. For I say it, the Lord will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Yeah, it's just the first one. We need to understand the protection of God is around each one of us like a wall of fire. The devil can't cross that unless the Lord gives him permission. And if the Lord gives him permission, it's to teach us something. It's so that we will be able to minister to other people. There are times of consecration and prayer before God that keeps us from sin and keeps us loving the sinners. Those times with God are what motivate us to do more for God. You see, the Bible also says in this passage, if we were to read more, it tells us it's time to rejoice. You see, when we rejoice, what we don't realize is we're breaking more chains of the people around us. Who are watching us rejoice. <coughs> Rejoicing is so important to cruising altitude. And we've got to start recognizing everyday miracles. Like during COVID. I left Francis Town on a bus to go to Gaboron. I got there after dark. And when I got off the bus, I had never been on a bus in this area of Africa before in my life. So I had some fear. As I got off the bus, people were saying, Taxi mum, taxi mum, taxi mum. <laughs> and I'm like, No, no. And then I saw Brother Paul, the little Filipino man. I almost lunged for him and jumped on top of him. <laughs> I was so glad to see a face I recognized. <laughs> okay? So, what I'm trying to tell you in that is that, <coughs> excuse me, when we step out by faith, and it looks like we're failing, God always has a means of escape planned. <coughs> and provision. He always has provision. So it's time, I'm, I'm skipping over to page 86. We've got to know some steps. Actually, the bottom of page 85. We're at 1 Timothy 4.16 at the bottom. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Excuse me. Let's see first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here the apostles basically saying, wake up. That's what he's saying to us, wake up. No one among us wants to be the unpopular preacher. You see, I've had to get used to it. I know when I walk in, I'm there to plow. 
That means I've got to sink the plow down into the ground. And I've got to pull out the rocks and the weeds that have gotten into the church and maybe into the pastor or the leadership. And I know at some churches I'll only preach there once. <laughs> but when I finish, I will have obeyed God. And then it's up to them what they do with what God sent me there to them. <laughs> and you have to be comfortable with that as leaders. We should not always be harsh. Jesus was the great shepherd. <laughs> and he would take the hook of the shepherd's staff and gently draw a lamb back. We have to know when to be harsh and when to be loving. And we have to know how to put the two together so that people understand we're only doing this because we love them. So going above cruising altitude, we have to always ask God for his counsel. When the devil finds out we've been promoted spiritually, he comes after us. And it ain't pretty. And sometimes we don't do well. But, the, but, but it's not about our failures. If you fail, you got to get back up again. And when you get back up again, bloodied and hurting, you kneel on your knees and you pray and you ask God to help you do better. You don't stop. I believe it was uh, Michael Jordan and I know most of you know that name, had the most misses of basketball shots than anyone else. But he's also famous because he had the most baskets. That's why you just have to keep trying. If you fail, big deal. Go seek counsel. Go to prayer. Get back up. Don't stop. We'll love you back. We'll help you. That's what we're here for. Okay? And we have to seek counsel with God. And then, as we continue going above cruising altitude, which in August when I fly home, when I leave London, the, the plane will get up between 30 and 40,000 feet. And something I've noticed is as you get up about maybe 10,000 feet, you go through the low clouds. And then you go up another 10,000 feet. And you have to go through some other clouds. And then you go another 10,000 feet. And you, and you go through other clouds. It's like our relationship with God. Different levels. Each level has different challenges. Mm -hmm. The pilot has to do different things to get to the next level. It's the same with our relationship with God. And we have to stay above cruising altitude. And I'm not going to read 1 Samuel 13, 8 through 14 on page 90. Because we know the story. Rather, if you're a leader, you should know this story. Samuel, or, or not with Saul. Saul got tired of waiting on God, of waiting on Samuel the prophet. So he stepped out of his role and stepped into the role of the prophet, which was against God. Whatever God's called you to do, 
As we say in America, stay in your lane. <laughs> or like when you're driving down the road. Don't try to pass when you're not supposed to. Stay where you're supposed to be. If God wants to take you to that place, he'll take you there. But don't force it. Mm. You force it, and you'll lose out on the promises God has for you. Mm. Just ask Saul. Mm. He lost the kingdom. Mm. He didn't just lose out with God. Mm. He lost everything. Mm. Men and women of God are placed on um, pedestals or above other people. Like if he honors me tomorrow. When he honors me tomorrow. I will say thank you. And then I'll say let's give this to God. And I'll say let's worship him. God doesn't share his glory with anybody. Yes. It's his and his alone. And when we go above cruising altitude, like let's say the pilots cruise along at 35,000 feet, and he sees storm clouds, but he sees if he goes up, if he goes up, he can fly over the storm. The only way he knows how to go up is because he studied and he knows what that plane will do. Just as we should have studied this book and we know what God will do. And when we know what God will do, we have made preparation to bring the ark of God to a place of honor in our lives. Let's read 1 Corinthians 9 and 27 on page 92. It's about the middle of the page. <coughs> but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Did you find it? First Corinthians nine and twenty seven. Page ninety two, the middle. First Corinthians nine nine twenty seven. Kuti cook check it as a miriedu iri irukunamari kutisha kutisha ziziswa muku shumiwa zive shati chengeteza. And then we have to give instruction. On what must happen before the ark can be brought in. And sometimes we have to give instruction to our congregations and to ourselves. On how to usher in the presence of God. So that we can have tongues and interpretation. Or the word of prophecy. We have to teach the young people how to do it. If they get up to sing after I have preached. And they immediately start with a lot of music. That's really fast and really hard. You know what I mean. But I ended the service quietly. They should understand. Especially the one on the keyboard. That he just sits there. And he waits till a minister points. I believe we've missed many times God would have liked to have spoken to us. Because it's mainly our young people who are doing the music. But they, we haven't taught them. It's not their fault. It's our fault. So we've got to teach them how to wait on God. 
Tofana kwa zikuwa zivisa kutu wano mirira seo uwepo wa maru kutu uwepo. And to know their place. Kutu wazi otu wangu wa ripapi pa chinchupo shawo. So that they don't get out of their place. Kutu wazi abude pa chinchupo shawo. And then it causes all of us to miss out on something wonderful from God. Shoka shakonzi risa wati tiraskiru wetis. You understand what I'm saying? Mutu sa shanduk taura. I'm not beating you up, okay? Ani suku kuwo meserai. It's an issue the world over. Especially in America. Okay, I'll be the first one to say that. There's this one church I preached at for six months. God would open my messages. God would close them and give the altar call. I'd never have anything I've never been part of anything like that anywhere else in the world. It was that church full of new converts that didn't know how to have church. But they had been schooled on how to wait on God. Nobody was in a hurry. We wouldn't get out of church till late. It was, a, it was unbelievable. I mean, for six months, I watched this happen. And I, I finally got to where when I would step to the pulpit. I wouldn't say anything. I'd wait. Because I knew what was going to happen. I'd wait on God. And when I got done, I didn't give an altar call. I'd wait on God to give it. And he would. Because God was teaching me something through those six months. And no, it's not going to be like that every service, every place. It was what that church needed at that time. But we've got to understand this so that we know when these things are about to happen. I had no clue what I was doing. God had to teach me. And teach me he did. Okay? So let's talk about staying above cruising altitude. And maintaining it. First, 2 Timothy 1, 4 through 5, at the bottom of page 93. It says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Down to the very bottom. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. And then verse 6, down at the top of page 94, sort of. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. You see it? First Tim Second Timothy? Yes. Verse 6, 1 and 6. Yes. And in the Can you open the Look at this. Second Timothy. Page 94. Second Timothy. Page Under 94. B. Second Timothy. One and six, yes. Just verse yes. six. Yeah. Second Timothy. Chapter one, verse six. Yes. You have seen it. Oh, my. Where is it? I think I want to see the video. From the story of the show, the guy is the one. You should go to the one. You should go to the one. You see, the older ones of us in this room, if you younger ones don't succeed, it's our fault. Y'all agree with me, the older ones? Because it's our responsibility to say, hey, God's got his hand on your life. And God's going to do something special with you. And God's got his hand on your life. And on your life. And on your life. We've got to shake you and tell you and give you an opportunity to minister. Even when you say, I can't do that. 
At that church I spent six months in, let me tell you what they do with their young people. Anyone from the age of seven to sixteen. On Wednesday nights. Has five minutes. And they're on a schedule. It's just one each Wednesday night. Some of them can out preach me. The anointing that's on them is unbelievable. Mm. But we've got to give them the opportunity. And five minutes, they can't do much harm. They're allowed to sing or preach. And some of those little kids get up there that are seven and can barely talk well. And they start to sing with a song that has the artist singing it. And the Holy Ghost falls on the crowd. Why? Because a seven-year-old knows pure worship. They don't have the hang-ups we have. So we need to give opportunity for those to do something in the house of God. And then they'll go way above our cruising altitude. And they'll choose to go even higher than we ever even dreamed. And that, that's the best compliment a leader can get. And I believe we have too many people who are dictators in our churches. We have Sunday school teachers who are dictators. We have pastors who are dictators. That doesn't work. Just like it doesn't work in a country. People rebel when a dictator takes over. And the young people and the children will rebel when we dictate to them. Yes, we need to be able to correct them. Yes, we need rules. But we can't be mean. We've got to show them the love of God. We've got to give to them the mercy that we want God to extend to us. And when we do, we will find more of our youth staying in the church. A lot of them have left with such a bad taste in their mouth. That even if you would give them a million dollars. They wouldn't walk in one of our churches. That's our fault. Because we were mean. So what if they come to church in shorts and a tank top? Love them. Love them to God. They're testing you. They're pushing you to see if you really mean what you say about Jesus. And you have to push back with love and love them. I'm not saying let them on the platform like that, okay? But I'm saying love them. Okay? Then the price of achieving above cruising altitude. And I'm getting close to being done, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to read it, but Mark 10, 35 through 45 at the top of page 96. Mark 10, verse 35, is a story, if you're leaders, you know well. It's where James and John come to Jesus. And he says, will you do whatever we want you to do? And he says, what do you want? And he says, well, you see, they were full of themselves. They thought they were somebody. They thought they'd arrived. Well, I want to sit on the left hand and he wants to sit on the right hand of you. When we get to heaven. Yes. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? When people have said they want my anointing. I've said, really? Do you want to go through what I've been through? 
Do you want your children to cuss you out? Do you want the police to tell you they're going to send you to prison for your husband's murder? Do you want the doctor to send you home to die? Do you want to wonder where your next meal is coming from? Be careful what you ask God for. He just might give it to you. But there's a long road of sacrifice to get to that elevated place with God. And then Jesus tells them, because they say, oh yeah, we can drink of that cup. Sure you can. You want to be crucified? You want to be boiled in oil? You want to be stoned? I'm being honest. And we're in the day and age for those of you that are under the age of 30 will probably end up giving your lives for this gospel. I'm being very honest. You know I'm right. That's what the book says in the book of Revelation. I'm not a prophecy preacher. I don't attempt to go there much. I know my limitations. <laughs> not my thing. <laughs> I'll get you all messed up if I try to teach Revelation. <laughs> but, but I want you to think carefully. Because when you ask God for something like that, and then all hell breaks loose against you, remember the prayer you prayed. Because you ask God, and He's only allowing you to be brought through the fire to see if you're made of gold, to see if you'll survive it, so that you can be that great person you've asked God to let you be. You see, after I suffered cancer, I made the mistake of looking at the book of Job. And where it said he got double. I said, God, I don't want a double portion. I want a double of the double portion. You know what I ask God for in my stupidity? I ask God to be crucified more. I ask God to be tried more. I ask God to be tempted more. That's what I ask God for. And yes, God has placed a great anointing on my life. I realize that. But I also realize I've paid a great price. And so will you. So be very careful what you've asking for. And if we are in a service, we aren't ministry. No matter how big we get and how well known we get, we must always take time for everyone. I've stood before thousands in astrodomes in the Philippines and ministered. I'm not telling you that to make me look big. I'm telling you that so that in order to stand before thousands, you better always kneel before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you'd better always be willing to clean the toilets, sweep the church, or get up on the roof and nail more tin in it. Or dig holes if that's what it takes to build the church. You've got to always be willing to serve. You see, once David had orders from God, he simply obeyed. And I will read this because this is important. And we might go over just a few minutes, but not much. Uh, bottom of page 96, 1 Chronicles 21, 18 through 30. 1 Chronicles 21, 18 through 30. 
Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. I can't say that. <laughs> and David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. David, and Omen turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Omen was threshing wheat. And as David came to Omen, then David said to Omen, or no, and as David came to Omen, Omen looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Omen, Ornan, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. David, I got Kumbira Onan, who tap you and Shimbo Yakanga Puriwa, Goros, Kutavake Ata, Kutuanwa, Vavachi, Zikin Roku, Kushu, where do I wear? And Omen said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. I give it all. Onan Akamba, where does it say? Don't go to Tora, David, that you've got also wins on it. And King David said to Omen, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. As David, so David gave to Omen for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. David David 